Good morning and welcome to the Gospel Loft. We are taking a gap and we are reading a book together that I wrote some time ago, about two years ago, in German. It is called When, Angel, it's called when Angels Let You Fall and God Will Pick You Up Again. We started yesterday the first two chapters and we will carry on today with chapter 3 and chapter 4. And here we go. It was November. A Saturday just before lunch, I met a friend at Camps Bay Beach. We walked leisurely along the water's edge, cooling our toes in the 13 degree Atlantic Ocean, rather cold I say, deep in conversation, perhaps planning the next adventure. Two good-looking young women came towards us, and then suddenly the one lost her balance and bumped into me, muttering some apology. I had nothing better to say as, uh, would you two ladies join us for lunch? Where these words came from is still a mystery until today. In those days, the old Camps Bay Hotel served bar lunch on the terrace. It was good and easy fun, except the one dropped her plate on the floor and guess which one I had my eye on. Yes, the one that dropped the plate. What I did not know at the time was their secret plan of an upcoming intrigue. One of the girl's name was Annette. Later I found out she was called Vicky as well. She had waited for her boyfriend on the grass verge under the palm trees until he was going to close his beach cafe when she spotted us walking along the water's edge about 50 meters away. Without a premeditated thought, she told her friend, Can you see the two guys at the beach near the water's edge? There goes my future husband, she says. Do you know them and which one is it? Her friend asked. The short one, she said, and I have never seen him in my life before. How do you know this? You are waiting for your boyfriend. Never mind the boyfriend, she says. Let's bump into them when they turn back. You wouldn't dare, she says. Would you? Said the other one, knowing good well that the adventure would just about begin. I was, of course, the short one in the story. Well, three and a half months later, on the 24th of February, 1968, we got married. Surprise? No, not at all. And we are married now 52 years. And what a wedding it was. But first I had to get to know her family. Her father was an elderly, tall Englishman. Such people played golf on Wednesday afternoon and they spoke with a hot potato in their mouth. In conversation with them, you just nodded, pretending that you have understood what they said. Yeah, he was a commissioned officer in the British Army during World War II in the Far East. The mother was Galina Lanskaya from a well-known Russian family, 14 years younger than her husband. She had the temperament to go with it and a heavy accent rolling her arse. All that together with an Elizabeth Taylor look. There was surely to be some head butting in the future, I thought. A few years ago, I wrote a book about these two unusual people under the title A Meeting in India and a Sunset in Table Bay. I would like to describe just one little episode how a family drama can evolve. As a European one has to learn a lot about English colonial culture. In Europe people eat because they are hungry and you hear knife and fork hitting the plate. Not so in a well-brought-up English household. The ritual and the code of conduct is much more important than the food. The right flowers and the right tablecloth, the proper place for knives and forks are much more important than what appears eventually on the plate. No wonder they had to import French chefs to do the cooking and turn a pig into pork. There was also no clutter heard from knives and forks and plates colliding. Then it was, of course, important that one asked the father for the daughter's hand in marriage. It was 
emphatically drilled into my head not to fail this most important test a future son-in-law had to pass. Everything was choreographed beforehand so that nothing would go wrong or against tradition. I have to explain in a few words how my dining room furniture was created, as it was my own handiwork. Now, the only place known to me at that time where wood could be bought was at the boat builders at the harbour. Now, the wood was as hard as iron, and whether screw no nail could ever go in was just a mystery. The only possible way to get legs to the benches and the table was to cross them and then insert the legs loosely. The furniture was so heavy that it stood quite sturdy under its own weight. So far, so good. Until, oh yes, until one was trying to shift the bench or the table, my future mother-in-law and my future wife had arranged that they would go to the kitchen after dinner and give me the opportunity to speak to her father and gain a yes word from him. It all went well. The woman left for the kitchen. But John Wright, my future father-in-law, had to go to the toilet. He got up, wanted to move the table out of the way, and the whole lot came crashing down, plates and all. John never lost the nerve, and he said without a tremble in his voice, Yes, you can marry her. That was that, and it was the first and last time that we worked together as a team to build up the table again. Soon after that, Mr. and Mrs. left, and we washed up. Then came the wedding. The traditional normal was a wedding cake, a visit to a church, photographs, flowers, and a reception. We both were unbelieving heathens and had no idea about the religious part of this event. Father-in-law was traditionally an Anglican. My mother-in-law was religiously confused and had grown up under communism in Russia. But somehow it was expected from us that we would follow the or Anglican tradition. Without being a member of any church, it would be difficult to find a minister willing to marry us. Friends of my wife's, they knew about an Anglican minister who would marry anyone as long as they were not married to someone else at the time. We went to see this man, and he seemed just to be interested in how much we had to pay him and the lady that was going to play the organ. The minister looked at the wedding business as his extra income and had normally six weddings on a Saturday afternoon. My wife had a built-in saving program and convinced the man that we would be number six, as the church would be full of flowers from number one to number five, and we would save the expenses of buying flowers. She also named the date when we should get married, the 24th of February, just before the tax year ended, and we were taxed for the whole year as a married couple. The saving that we made paid for our honeymoon. The reception was at Constantinec. We hired a special private dining room and in the main hall was a live band playing music. It was like a dinner dance. Next to our dining room was Chris Barnard, the heart surgeon, with his party, whom we met much later in life again when he opened an art exhibition for me. The next day we drove to Wilderness on the east coast near Neisner. It was a famous honeymoon destination and all the couples came to late breakfast. I went water skiing for the first time in my life and the boatman took me all the way to the very end of the lagoon. My new wife thought that I must have been eaten up by a great fish as return was somewhat delayed. When I got back, my figure on the skis must have been quite comical to look at, and I could hardly keep myself from falling off. I was so sore and tired. Then something happened on the way home, which took years of being put to rest. 
It was an almost unforgivable sin that I committed. We ran out of petrol on the way home and had to push the car slightly uphill. The same question repeated itself over the following years. Whenever we began a journey by car, are you sure we have enough petrol to get to, well, to get to wherever we want to go to? You'll remember what happened on, on after the honeymoon. Well, we were like two stones blasted out of the mountain with sharp edges, tumbling down into a riverbed and slowly being rounded through the storms of life. Amazing that love can do such a thing. Now and then the two stones crashed into each other and another sharp edge was gone. We stumble over stump and stone and land eventually in a quiet river where the water is just moving by. Everyday life looks like that. Yes, looking like all the others that went a similar way. And then we come to chapter 4. And here I have a scripture from Isaiah, chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government is upon his shoulder. Well, it was on the 21st of September 1968, about five in the morning, I brought a net with the first birth contractions to hospital around midnight. And, and th th they would call me when the time was closer to the event so that I could first-hand experience how my wife would face the suffering that was promised to Eve and to all the women that would follow. Rarely does a man look forward to this event, especially when it is the first time. It was no different in my case. I was hoping sincerely that all would be over when I put my foot over the threshold of the hospital. To help this idea along, I drove extremely slowly after the call had come through, yet in vain. My wife held out until she saw my face half hidden in a green theater gown. Then a son was born, Nikita, like Khrushchev, who hit the table at the meeting in Paris with his shoe. We gave our son a second name, John. It looked similar to my father-in-law's name, just without the H. It, it was actually Jonathan. We, we could always call it a spelling mistake to keep him in honor. In those days, I had no idea what the Bible was saying about the government resting upon his shoulders. Yet it became soon evident that newly born children had a natural ability to take up governmental office almost immediately within the household after birth. In Zurich, I lived in a loft apartment right in the center of town. It had to have an artistic flair when I decorated it and furnished it. Yes, and I decided to hang all my furniture from the beams, the bed, the chairs, the table, just about everything was hanging from the ceiling. The first thing that I did in my Cape Town flat was to install a beam in one of the rooms and bought a basket which was duly hung on it. It became our son's first bed with a specific purpose. He had this common habit of waking up too often and we were really, really tired. I tied a string to the basket, a stone at the other end within reach from the bed. As soon as the first noise was heard, I pulled on the string and the good boy went back to sleep for a little longer. Unfortunately, he grew out of the basket too quickly and the next size bed was too big to be hanged from the beam. During the pregnancy, another problem developed which needed to be taken care of. We needed a phone in the flat. There were only a few lines available and all reserved for business. What now? Well, apply for a business phone was the answer without thinking of the consequences. We filled in the forms and we hoped for the best. A miracle. We got a phone. 
Then one sunny morning, someone knocked at the front door. The man was an inspector from the telephone company and wanted to know what the name of the business was, as we had failed to enter it on the application form. He saw immediately that there was no business, but we, or he must have, felt sorry for us and gave us a little grace to come up with a business in the next six weeks. Alternatively, we could face the consequences to be back blacklisted without hope for, to ever get a phone, lose the existing phone and get slapped with a hefty fine. What are we going to do now? A very specific character trend was emerging. My wife described it very well. My husband is a cork. You push him under and he just pops up again somewhere else. Well, I added something more to the same. I say, when the cork goes under, a fish is on the line. Yes, and now we needed a fish on the hook very fast. My wife is a hairdresser, so we just opened a hairdressing salon was my answer to that one. But she was heavily pregnant. Well, so we went out and we looked for suitable premises in spite of a big stomach. About 200 meters from where we lived, they were building the first shopping center in Cape Town. They were just about casting the foundations. No walls yet, but there was our answer. The billboards advertising the project had an address of the developer and the future letting agents. The next day, we were in their offices signing the rental contract to our new business called Vicky's Hair Boutique. The telephone was saved, but now we had to think about the whole shop fitting business with very limited, indeed, finance. We did not want to go into debt, and at the same time, we needed to do something original and out of the ordinary. We were not just ordinary people. We were Vicky and Werner. We needed a follow-up miracle. Shop fitting was extremely expensive, and we could not afford to employ a company to do this for us. My wife had a second name, Ludvika. And this, is, in short, brings us to Vicky for short, and therefore also Vicky's hair boutique. Now, action was needed and I designed the furniture in spite of my bad experience with my dining room design. Well, we got some shutters as partitioning, painted them white, the wood we stained dark brown and the upholstery we covered with orange material. The two-room flat was re reorganized. One room became the storeroom, the other the living bedroom, the bathroom was turned into a workshop and the kitchen was where we entertained the guests. The stuff just piled up from floor to ceiling, wash basins, dryers, furniture, mirrors. You name it, we collected it or made it. The neighbors looked as, at us strangely as I came home every day after work with five meter long planed uh, five millimeter square battens. Then I worked until 10 o'clock. A few weeks later, one weekend, we moved everything into our new shop and were open for business. Where the battens went in, furniture came out, neatly upholstered, and the neighbors' heads shook in disbelief, and the tongues wagged once more. Wonder what they are up to. Well, nobody had a hair salon like us. Some even thought it was a steakhouse. Can you believe it? Yet it was also a gallery, as there was a big naked white wall ideal to display my art. Now you could have your hair cut, permed, washed and set. And while you were talking to the hairdresser, she talked you into buying a piece of art. Well, nickel, little Nicky was now six weeks old and had right from the start a taste of what it meant to run a business. Well, my contract with the media company came soon to an end and I felt to be called to greater things. Here was my chance to find a new direction in life. But what was it? Art was not the 
breadwinning alternative. South Africa was not into art or anything resembling something modern. Perhaps some kitsch could sell, but it was not my thing. There had to be something which would suit my character and my being. Until next time, when we get to chapter 5.